What happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project. Nineteen eighty-two is in full swing now as we're delving into the spring entries, and slasher mania is just like it's in full force now. But as we're about to see from this list, there's some other options as well. And, and in case you're wondering, because I know some of you guys are curious, how many episodes there will be in each year? Nineteen eighty-two is slated to run ten full episodes. So even though we're in April and May here, we've got a long way to go before the end of the year. But there's some great horror on its way. This block starts on the same day that the last one ended, April 2nd, because that was a stacked day for horror, as we also saw the release of The Dorm That Dripped Blood, also known as Pranks, or Death Dorm. It begins with a dude being killed off by a slasher, and then there's a big party on a college campus, and we meet Joanne here, and she's friends with Princess Vespa. And this was Daphne Zuniga's very first acting role. And they're talking about taking on a job of cleaning out the dormitory in order to prepare it to be demolished. And none of these people look like college students. Like, I know that there are older college students, but this is like an exclusive college for 30 year olds only. And Daphne Zuniga, who was 20. She doesn't last long though, since that night, the unseen killer murders her parents and then runs her over with a car. The slasher then continues his efforts of killing, including a power drill death, all the while the local homeless man acts as a red herring. And this had a pair of directors in Stephen Carpenter and Jeffrey Obrow, and the two worked together pretty frequently. They did this together, and then The Power in 1984, and The Kindred in 1987. After that, it seems that Obrow started directing on his own, while Carpenter tended to shift more into writing, although he did write and direct the Scream knockoff Soul Survivors by himself in 2001. This was a first film for both of them. Carpenter wrote the script, along with Stacey Giacchino, when they were still in film school at the University of California, the same school where the movie was shot. It was done on a very low budget, shooting at the school over the Christmas holiday, and on weekends afterwards, off and on. It got into trouble right away as the violence in the film earned it an X rating, and they had to chop it down significantly in order to reach an R. In England, they made them remove some of the murder scenes in total, and even after doing so, it still landed on the video nasty list, mainly solely due to the image of a spiked baseball bat on the box art. Although it was placed on the list, it wasn't actually prosecuted and was shortly after removed from it. It was first released as Pranks in the US, but after it failed to generate business, they re-released it in 1983 as the dorm that dripped blood. Although it didn't really seem to increase ticket sales all that much, like, Critics didn't really boost it either, since it was universally panned and sits at a dismal 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. And I don't think it's like 0% bad, but I'm still only giving it a 2. Sure, it has a nice vibe, but it's nothing you haven't seen before, is insanely predictable, and just feels a bit pointless in the end. Its horror cultural significance is a 1.5 since it's only barely really known, and mostly for having a ripped off title. Should you watch it? Y you can skip it. You you've seen this all before. Greg, this isn't funny anymore! One day later on April 3rd, a very different kind of horror was released with Yin Ji. Although, that's the date it was released here. It actually came out a tad earlier in Hong Kong, where it debuted on February 19th. But it came out here on 4-3, and was instead called Kung Fu From Beyond the Grave. You have Chun Sing here, who has a supernatural encounter that's it's difficult to explain, so I'll just let Chun describe it. Tell me what's happened. I just talked to Dad's ghost. Then there's a tense battle. And this guy, who may or may not be 
The Rock murders another martial arts master through treachery, an act that Chun witnesses. He finds a book of magic and heads to a nearby town that has some interesting issues since they have to scalp the recently killed so that they don't return to life, and encounters the man who his father sent him to get revenge on. Of course, some quality chop sake ensues since that guy's right hand man is the man in yellow from the woods. But that's not all. It, it's not just swinging arm tactics, since there's also some Jiangxi, otherwise known as Chinese hopping vampires, and they're causing trouble as well. Like, you see, in the wake of the success of Close Encounters of the Spooky Kind, which I previously covered on the project, a bunch of different martial arts films cropped up in which the hero would face off against some supernatural opponents. And Billy Chong, noted kung fu star at the time, wanted to get in on it. He had previously appeared in a lesser known entry called Kung Fu Zombie in 1981, and this was his follow-up, which got a touch more success and a small American theatrical run. This was near the end of Chong's Hong Kong career, and he was reputed to be a touch difficult to work with, and perhaps a little lot arrogant, which burned some bridges, and a year after this would return to his home in Indonesia to continue his career there. And honestly, it's not hard to imagine this one in particular had a big influence on Big Trouble in Little China, what with the opposing magical priests, the yellow headbands, and finger moves, and throw everything at you one after another tone. And when I say throw everything at you, I mean there's even a bit with Count Dracula appearing to stir up some problems. Count Dracula, come to my aid! I'm coming! <laughs> and oh yeah, did I mention that a plot point of this film is that the evil wizard activates his magic by covering himself in the blood of human hearts? Well, that doesn't sound too weird, but they have to specifically be the hearts of a man and woman who are having an orgasm at the same time during sex. And what a silly fun movie that this is. I'm giving it a three and a half because I have a soft spot for old kung fu movies. And this is just classic. Uh, its significance is just a 1.5 though, since it was pretty popular in its home country, but it didn't really make a dent here. Should you watch it? I mean, if you grew up on kung fu theater and horror movies, this is the best of both worlds, so yes. This next one arrived on my birthday, April 15th, although only in Italy. Um, and, and when I say that, I mean that the movie arrived because my birthday is April 15th in every country. And it's Don't Look in the Attic, which kicks off in a really wild fashion as two men fight, with one killing the other, only to be killed by a woman, who then encounters moving chairs and zombie hands. And afterwards we find out that the old mansion is being fixed up, with the workers encountering some unusual circumstances. There's then Elisa here who goes out to a seance, and her mother reaches out to her to try to warn her away from going to Turin, and has a meltdown. Don't go to Turin. Don't go to the villa. Be warned, don't go to Turin. Don't go. I wonder what my mother was trying to say. She was literally saying, don't go to Turin. It's not like it was in code. So, knowing as little about you as I do, I can't work out what your mother's message may have meant. Um, there's a place. It's called Turin. Don't go there. Not that hard to piece together. So Elisa goes to Turin, of course, and she inherits that villa. You know, the one her mother was explicitly telling her to not go to, along with a couple of cousins that she's never met. They all go to the villa together, and sure enough, after a while, strange stuff starts to happen. And though this one is credited to a Charles Austin, that's a pseudonym for Carlo Alcino who was super active in the industry and mostly did sci-fi and action films, but this was his first dip into the horror world. He had landed a deal with a French company to make the film, provided that he used French actors in it, leading him to cast Jean-Pierre Aumont as one of the leads, but managed to still work in some of his Italian regulars in there as well. And here's the thing, by the time that this one is half over, 
You'll be struggling to figure out what the point of it all is, since there doesn't really seem to be a central storyline. And I, I'm not sure what the general plot is outside of people go to a cursed villa. And who doggy is this one a mess? And I'm just giving it a one and a half. It's boring and muddled and the definition of drudgery. Not exactly what I would call a birthday treat. Its significance is the same, uh, since it's not really talked about and doesn't really feature any famous names, but it's at least a little known. Should you watch it, this is a very easy skip. It's almost finished now. You won't have long to wait for me to join you. Our accursed family is now extinct. A few days later, in France, not too far from Italy, on April 21st, we got the curious release of Oasis of the Zombies. Although this wasn't the last time it will be released, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it's got two ladies on a trip to the desert, and they find this oasis in the middle of it that seems to have swastikas laying around and war weaponry, and they find themselves attacked. And then there's these two guys who are on the hunt for lost gold, Nazi gold. And this guy was the head of the platoon of Nazi soldiers guarding it, and kills the man who tells him where to find it. Meanwhile, Robert, a student, finds out that his father was one of the allies that fought those soldiers and barely survived, and he wrangles up a group of his peers to go and look for the money. But the evil Kurt is there first, and his men are attacked by the zombies of the Nazi soldiers, and they eat them all, including Kurt's wife. He gets bitten and starts to turn, and the students start to make their way to the oasis. But of course, they do so very, very slowly, making sure to pause and have some sex, because this is yet another entry from Jess Franco, his fifth that I've covered so far on the project. We've previously talked about his films Devil Hunter, White Cannibal Queen, Bloody Moon, and Sex is Crazy, and they all had this same kind of lethargic pace to them. And the weird thing about Spain that I mentioned earlier is that this film came out a year later over there in the March of 1983, and Spain is Franco's home territory, and he shot another version of the film for that market. You'd think that it would be as simple as doing a Spanish dub, considering all the audio was done in post anyway, but no, Franco actually shot another version using different actors. Instead of Henri Lambert and Miriam Lanson playing Kurt and his wife, he had his friends and regular stars Eduardo Fajardo and Lina Romay play those roles. Currently though, it seems as if the French version is the only way to see this one, and the Spanish one is considered to be lost. What's strange is that one year prior, Franco was supposed to write and direct Zombie Lake, which I covered in the 81 project, which also features Nazi zombies, but left that project when he wasn't satisfied with the budget. But it, I suppose he liked the concept and subject matter and did his own take here. And this is just a 1.5 from me. I'm really not a fan of Franco's lackadaisical style, and this one is the definition of plotting. I liked some of the shots of the zombies near the finale, though. Its significance is the same since it's not that well known, although it has a very slight amount of recognition and is a part of Franco's lineup. Should you watch it? Not really. This oasis is just a mirage. Our next entry takes us further across the world, over to Australia, because on April 30th, there was the release of Next of Kin. Not to be confused with the 1989 film with Patrick Swayze. No, this is the tale of Linda, who inherits her mother's estate in Montclair, a large retirement community. And after arriving, she finds her old diary. That night, they get a new resident, and Linda begins having bad dreams and the next day, one of them is found dead in the tub. She reunites with an old flame, and it's Mick Taylor of all people, so I guess watch your back. And later, she finds records that seem to show that her Aunt Rita, long thought dead, lived quite a bit longer than she had previously been told. More spooky stuff seems to be happening all around her, and what the hell is this thing? Anyone Excuse me, have you seen that? That's genuinely terrifying. 
Combined with payments made to Rita after her death and one of the residents saying that she didn't die, Linda starts to suspect that she's still there, haunting the place, and she begins uncovering all the secrets that the center holds within. And this, this one's by Tony Williams, and he was a New Zealand-born director and didn't do too much. He, he worked in television through the 70s and did one feature called Solo in 1978, and then this film. After this, though, he pretty much dropped out of the film world completely, working in commercials until 2013, more than 30 years later, and has since made several documentary films. And it's a damn shame that he went so long out of the film world because even though the overall story of this one isn't really anything new, it's a marvelous bit of atmosphere. It's been described online as Dario Argento's Shining, and, and that's a pretty accurate assessment. It has this whole giallo kind of thing going on, but also the moodiness and unclear descent into insanity that you're getting from Kubrick's film, and it's just squished full of atmosphere. A good chunk of that comes from the music by the late Klaus Scholz, who was once in Tangerine Dream. And according to the director, Scholz wrote an original score for the flick, but they turned it down because they had used temp tracks from his existing discography, which fit better. It didn't really make an impact at the time and has sort of like been forgotten, but has seen a bit of a revival recently due to being featured in a documentary of Ozploitation flicks in which Quentin Tarantino praised it and compared it to The Shining. And I wouldn't go that far, but it is damn good. And this was actually a first time watch for me and I'm giving it a four. Uh, this is a great surprise full of mood and tension. Its significance is only a two though, since this is very infrequently talked about and hardly known and frequently confused for the later film with the same name. Should you watch it? Yeah, absolutely. Don't leave it down under. Look, a coffee? Hamburger? All in trouble? Did you and Barney have an argument? We are now headed into May for a May 7th release with the unveiling of The Forbidden World. It kicks us off with a robot and some spaceship footage that appears to be from Battle Beyond the Stars. And Captain Mike Colby here is diverted to a mission on Zarbia. And he arrives at the genetic research facility there and the doctor's there and oh no, Janine is here. Don't tell Nigel. It seems that they created this mutation here, referred to as a Subject 20 that's rapidly changing and maturing, and is currently cocooned. It hatches and goes on the attack, killing Buck, and then getting loose, making its way through the crew. And, and hey, speaking of making his way through the crew, Colby makes time with both of the women on board, and Subject 20 keeps getting bigger and bigger. Kind of like a certain alien from a movie. Um, what, what is that movie called? The, the, the one with the, the one, the one about the alien. And this is clearly a bit inspired by that Ridley Scott classic, but honestly, not too much. It, it was from Alan Holzman and was kind of sort of his first film since he apparently also co-directed the 1981 action flick called Firecracker, although wasn't credited. So this was his first credited solo feature. He was hired by Roger Corman to make it, and if it seems like the intro scene to the film with the space battle doesn't really fit in with the rest, it's because Corman told Holzman that he could have four days to impress him by making a complete opening to a space action movie and was provided with an astronaut and a robot and not much else. The director threw together the little dogfight sequence and Roger liked it, so he hired him on to make the whole thing. It was shot on a fairly low budget, under a million, and repurposed a lot of other Corman stuff. Like I said earlier, they just splice in the Battle Beyond the Stars bits, but they also reuse several of the sets from the previous year's Galaxy of Terror. Holzman states that nearly every asset that they use in the film was left over from some sort of previous Corman production, with the exception of the women's outfits. As the creature grows, it changes into this vaguely xenomorph looking thing, and when they got to the editing phase of the post-production, they realized that they needed more of it. So they brought in John Carl Beekler to redo some bits and add some more monster action. Speaking of editing, Holzman's original cut contained quite a bit of humor to it and more comedy, 
but Corman hated it and asked for it to be recut with the jokes edited out. A DVD release in 2010 contained a version with more comedy in it, and when it was released, it took a lot of heat for being an alien knockoff, but it, but it was pretty successful, bringing in four million in ticket sales, and then performed very strongly on the home market. It was remade in 1991 under the title of Deep Space, bringing in the Beastmaster himself, Mark Singer, to play the Colby part, and that version starred a young Brian Cranston. And this is a three from me. This is fun. It, it lags a bit, uh, but then it's just throwing a bunch of kooky weirdness at you and some genuinely enjoyable creature stuff. But its plot is pretty standard. Its significance is a 2.5 since it's a bit more well known, but not really. It's a cult hit at best with only base level name recognition. Should you watch it? Yeah, I mean, this is worth the time. On that same day, May 7th, there was a very different and way more grounded entry with Death Valley. This one opens with the head vampire and little Ralphie walking around and their father and son. And Paul just went through a divorce. And the little guy is heading off to Arizona to stay with his mom for a while. His mom had better not buy him a toy doll. And his new boyfriend is a puppet master. And they pass through Death Valley. He spots this spooky old car passing through, and shortly after, a young couple are murdered in an RV. Um, and then the little ranger wanders off and stumbles onto the crime scene. There, he finds a little pendant in the shape of a frog and takes it with him, and notices that a number of people around town all have animal pendants, and their waiter, Hollis Mason, has one that matches. He sees that Billy has it, and a little later they see the RV being hauled in by police, and by police, I mean Blair, who seems to recognize the little pendant, setting off a game of cat and mouse with a few twists in its roster. And this one is directed by Dick Richards, a man who I'm sure was never made fun of for his name, and he had helmed a couple of movies before this and one or two afterwards, but was mainly known for his work in TV commercials. Oddly enough, this was the same year that he would end up being nominated for an Oscar, but, but not for this movie. No, he served as a producer on Tootsie, which was up for Best Picture, but didn't win. What's weird is that it said that this is the feature film debut of Peter Billingsley, and AFI even listed as such, but he had actually been in several movies before this, and just one year later would be in Christmas Story. It spends a pretty solid portion of the runtime dealing with the relationship with Billy and Mike's effort to win him over, and it takes quite a bit of time to get to the thick of the story, instead taking diversions such as the babysitter really wants Billy's gyps, and Mike and Sally go on a date. Which is likely why it received a healthy portion of negative reviews at the time, and was a bit of a box office disappointment. And this is another one that I'm giving a three to. It's good, but it's not great. There's some solid stuff in the beginning, and the end is pretty awesome, but holy crap does it take its time to get there. Plus, the twist is really obvious. Its significance is only a two because it's all but forgotten and didn't really leave a dent in the horror world, but get some boost for having a handful of really recognizable faces. Should you watch it? Yeah, probably. It's not great, but it's a decent watch. Real cowboy. Right, Mom? Pretty funny. Get in the car. One week later, on May 14th, we got a little more traditional take on the old slasher flick with Death Screams, which also went by the title of Night Screams, as well as House of Death. It starts off by letting us know exactly what kind of movie it is by having two people making out by the river killed by an unseen murderer. We're then introduced to an assortment of townsfolk, including the man-child Casey, and there's a carnival coming to town. Bob and Kathy here, who are on summer break from college, are preparing to go back to school, and they're working that carnival. And the whole town is attending, including the unruly teens who are planning to go to a bonfire later that night. They invite Neil, the ball coach, who I guess is signified as being a dignified dude by wearing a sweater wrapped around his neck, and his jealous ex-girlfriend, who shaving creams his car, is soon arrowed and then bagged. 
That night, while people are at the bonfire, the killer goes into action, flashing through the inhabitants. And, and this may seem like pretty standard stuff, but the more interesting thing is the guy behind the camera. You see, this is the work of David Nelson, and depending upon how old you are, that last name of Nelson might hit differently, because he's the son of Ozzy and Harriet Nelson, stars of the long-running TV show The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. He acted on the show as well, playing himself in over 400 episodes. As he got older, he even directed a handful of those episodes and then moved on to doing a couple of other TV shows, but not much. And then there was this, just, just out of the blue. Wholesome, squeaky clean image Dave Nelson makes a slasher flick, which, which is pretty weird. It was the only one that he would do as well, with his only other couple of films being either action or drama. And oh, it, yeah, if you're not that old for the whole Ozzy and Harriet thing, this guy is the uncle of Gunner and Matthew, the Nelson twins. And, and yes, I saw them live with Cinderella back in like, I don't know, 1991 or something. It, it wasn't very well regarded when it came out and didn't really make much money, which is probably why Nelson didn't really stick with the genre or get a ton more gigs. And it's probably not really helped by having one of the most easily guessed killer reveals in film history. Like, you'll say, it can't be this person because that would be insanely obvious and it has to be a red herring. But, but nope, that's it. And I'm just giving this one a 1.5. It has a nice vibe, but it, it's pretty dull and nothing you haven't seen 100 times before and done better. It's HCS is the same, uh, since it's not really spoken about and is mostly forgotten, but I'll give it the extra 0.5 for a notable director that's outside of his regular field. Should you watch it? Nah, I'll leave this scream on mute. On that same day, May 14th, we get a very different brand of horror with the release of The House Where Evil Dwells, which takes us back to 1840 in Japan, and we see a samurai discover his wife's infidelity and kills her lover, and then her, before committing seppuku. Flash forward to modern times and TV's Doug McClure is here, returning to the project after being in both Firebird 2015 and Humanoids from the Deep and he meets up with the family that's moving to Japan. And hey, speaking of people that are sons of people from classic TV shows, Edward Albert here is the son of Eddie Albert from Green Acres. But he was also just in Galaxy of Terror. And his wife is Susan George, who we just saw in 81's Venom. Even their kid has been on the project before since she was also in Humanoids from the Deep, so we have a bunch of recurring faces here. They're moving into a traditional Japanese house because even in the land of the rising sun, moving is the greatest terror. And almost immediately after arriving, weird things start to happen, like full-on ghosts appearing. But then they break into the new house with a really, really long sex scene that apparently wasn't in the script, but the producers demanded more sex and nudity in the film. Albert and George, and hey, kind of weird that both of their names are also guys' first names, uh, but they agreed to do it as long as they could be wearing underwear, and so that aspect had to be filmed around. Soon though, the spirits seem to be having an effect on the couple, and they both start to stray, influenced by the phantoms, who were shot with a particularly effective method. There's an interview with the director, Kevin Connor, who had previously done the great Motel Hell but also the land of time for God. And he claimed that they used a German technique called Schufthausen, in which you shot with a right angled mirror and put the actors against a black background in order to fade them in and out with your main shot. Since this was done well before compositing on a computer, made it easy peasy. But the odd thing is that I tried to further research this technique in order to get a more in-depth description of how they did it, but every single article simply pointed back to this movie. There was some contention after shooting since Connor handed in his cut and was then refused by the studio and they recut the film, taking out a good portion of the character interactions and leaving it as what the director called an empty film. I mean, I'm not sure how you'd call a movie featuring giant crabs that speak Japanese attacking a little girl empty though, but that's just me. 
And this is yet another three from me, and it's decent and a bit frustrating because it has moments of greatness lost in some general drudgery. Its significance is just a two though, since it's mostly not remembered and didn't really impact the genre, but it does have a nice assortment of known actors in it. Should you watch it? Yeah, uh, of course, even if just for the crab monsters. Best way to take it into a... Mm, an awful face in my soup! Here's another one out of Hong Kong, and this one came out on May 15th there, and it's Ghost Nursing, otherwise known by his Chinese title, Yang Gui. And it starts with this woman at the airport running away from a mob debt, and this music that I swear is sort of a disco version of the Amityville theme song. So Jackie here travels to Thailand and reunites with an old friend, and they go to a bar where a lounge singer is giving us a version of the greatest love of all that would put Mr. Randall Watson to shame. It's the greatest love. She gets into trouble immediately and is assaulted by a guy from the bar and then witnesses a shooting. So she consults with the local Taoist priest known as the God of Gold and they conduct a ceremony in which she is told to nurse a ghost, which means that she has to adopt the ghost of a child. She's then given this uh, thing and is told that she must conduct a very important ritual every night at midnight. And afterwards, anyone that crosses her path in a bad way meets a rough end, including a dude who just vomits up a bunch of maggots for no reason, and even zombies. And then there's more of that music. Only now it's even more blatantly just the Amityville tune. So does this count as an unofficial sequel? And this is directed by Wilson Tong, a martial artist who appeared in a large number of films from this era and also appears in this one. And in fact, that Amityville bit isn't the only ripped off tune since this sound that is played over and over and over and over again every time that something supernatural happens is lifted straight from a Tangerine Dream track called Movements of a Visionary. And this is one that starts off weird and then just keeps getting stranger and stranger until the over-the-top finale. And this is one that was lost for a little while. I mean, not like lost lost, but it's not one that was very well remembered. But recently, Vinegar Syndrome dug it up and put a new polish on it with a restored release that looks great and brought a little more needed attention to it. And it should have more attention because this was a blast and features what is probably one of the most abrupt and out of the blue endings in all of cinema. And I really had fun here and I'm giving it a 3.5. So some of my top scores in this block are going to Hong Kong. This is just some oddball goodness. Its significance is just a one though since it's not known at all over here and has no real relevance to the genre, although it possibly has more in its home country. Should you watch it? Oh, absolutely, give this baby a home. <laughs> this block ends on May 28th as we head back across the pond, although still not back to the US, but close enough, Canada, as we head into visiting hours. Lee Grant is here as the host of a talk show and her boss is Michael Myers' face. And she returns home to her pet parrot that I guess is just allowed to hang out around her place, like not in a cage, is, is that a thing? But then she's attacked by a crazed, mostly naked man who for some reason then removes all the piercings from his face and gets dressed. And hey, it's Lieutenant Rackzack. And he tries to kill her by dropping her in a dumb waiter, but she manages to survive. She gets admitted to the hospital where her nurse is Pam's mom, but Colt heads there in order to finish what he started. Once there, he gets distracted by killing some rando and a nurse, but then also deciding to go after Sheila and her family. Colt's a racist and also hates women and also attacks this young lady, and she may not look familiar, 
but if you listen to her voice only and pretend that she's talking in a silly southern drawl, you'll realize that this is the voice of the animated rogue. There's a mini appearance by Marty, or Morty, and boy oh boy does Colt take his time doing what he needs. Like, you get some backstory for him, but he just waits a while before eventually coming back after Deborah. And this was the English language debut film for director Jean-Claude Lord, Canadian guy whose previous movies were in French, and it was shot on a pretty decent budget of six million. It seems that originally Shatner was angling to play Colt and really wanted it, but the producers really liked Ironside since they worked with him in Scanners and told the Shat that he could have the part, but there was one more guy they wanted to see, and that was Ironside who got the part. And whereas there was this sort of underlying subtext in a lot of horror at this time about violence against women and misogynist killers who targeted them, this one put that whole aspect in the forefront by making the main character an outspoken proponent of women's rights and also a pacifist, and having the villain be a guy who puts hate mail on his walls complaining about minorities and women. It also got quite a bit of scorn from critics for this, since it seemed to want to make a statement about all that, while at the same time appearing to revel in it. But it did quite well anyway at the box office, pulling in a little over 13 million. One place it didn't do well was the UK, who of course put it on their video nasty list and cut out a minute of its runtime. And I'm going with a three here. It's fine and all, and it's a decent watch, but it seems to set everything up in a short amount of time, but then has to stall a whole lot to delay the fact that things should have wrapped up like an hour ago. Its significance is a three as well, since it's a bit more well known, but again, mostly on a cult level, and it does have a few very familiar faces. Should you watch it? Sure, give this one a visit. Who is this? So there you have it, uh, the spring of 1982, getting in, getting into the meat of the year here, and some really great movies in this list. Uh, my favorite of this bunch was Next of Kin, and uh, what a great surprise that that was. It was a first time watch for me, and that movie is a lot better uh, than I was expecting. Really good flick. I recommend checking that one out if you haven't already. There were some other really fun ones on this list. Uh, Ghost Nursing uh, was also a fun surprise. I was not expecting to enjoy that one as much as I did. So some good first time watches for me in this roster. Let me know which of these you have seen, which of these is your favorite, which of these you'd like to now check out. There's definitely a few on here I'd put on your list if you haven't seen already. Um, if you liked this, hit the like button, subscribe so you get all the 80s project updates as well, hit that bell so you get notified when they are released, and go to my Patreon page and check it out, help support this channel, help keep the project going like these guys do. I'd appreciate that. But yeah, uh, we're going to keep on steamrolling through this year because we're in 1982 now, but there's still a long way to go right here on the 80s project.